Hi there, welcome to The Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mugal, where I interview violinists from around the world. If you're new to the podcast, it would mean the world if you could subscribe and hit the bell notifications whenever new episodes come out. My guest today is a Canadian violinist who is the assistant concert master of the National Ballet of Canada. She has recorded for Naxos label and has performed as a soloist around the world. Please let me welcome Dr. Lynn Kuo. Uh, Lynn, it's so nice to meet you. And I'm so looking forward to this conversation. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. It's a nice honor. I've listened to so many of your episodes and to join your roster of amazing people. This is a thrill for me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. No, it's it's my pleasure. I'm always glad to continue providing value for the violin community. I think that's the whole point of the violin podcast is to kind of get different perspectives on an ever changing world in classical music. So but more on that later, because I definitely want to talk to you about your your violin chats. I want to talk to your uh, talk to you about your experience as um, as a pit musician for the ballet, because we've had orchestral musicians, we've had soloists, but we never really had a violinist who plays um, in an orchestra specifically for ballet. So I definitely want to touch base on that. But first of all, let's get to know you, Lynn. Um, who is Dr. Lynn Kuo? Let's, oh. let's have the audience know who Dr. Lin Kuo is. You know, it's, it's ironic that you, you asked me that question. Who is Dr. Lin Kuo? Because literally at 9 a.m. this morning, I posted an Instagram reel, a 15 second video with uh, Sleeping Beauty uh, waltz in the background as the, as the wallpaper music. And no it kidding. was basically a 15 second about me <laughs> reel. So if anyone's on Instagram, you can find me and see that about me reel. And it was to celebrate that I hit um, past, I surpassed 4,000 followers on Instagram. And so, congratulations. Thank you. That. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to point out, I had it in the caption and I think it didn't make the caption, but numbers actually don't mean anything to me. Numbers actually don't equate any worth or value or importance. So the number is just simply to say, oh, okay, I, I passed that milestone, but you know, I'll, I'll put it out there that number is just a number it doesn't mean you're any better or smarter or any more magnanimous as a what's the word mag magnanimous i can't even say the word anyway, magnificent <laughs> magnificent thank you that's even better easier to pronounce um magnanimous is that the word magnanimous i think it is yeah I think okay so. so who is who is lynn okay i'm well first of all i'm really very small violinist <laughs> I'm a very quirky violinist. I'm from Newfoundland, which is known as a very um, unusual province in Canada. We're an island. We're the butt of Newfoundlander jokes. And I made my way to Toronto, where I am now, and did three degrees in music. I have a doctorate, a, a DMA, Doctorate of Musical Arts, which my friend jokingly and lovingly says stands for doesn't mean anything. And Yeah, that's a classic I, DMA joke. <laughs> or doesn't matter anyway. That, doesn't that's my matter. favorite one. But so, by the way, by the way, not to devalue doctorate degrees, they they do serve a purpose in in music. You know, like it's. But all jokes aside, it, it you know getting a DMA is hard. So congratulations to you on that. Thank you. I did work hard for it, and again, like I don't attach much significance to the four K number and the, the the letters after my name. I don't think these mean anything really. What matters most important to me, and this is part of who I am as Lynn, a violinist or Lynn as a human being, is being a good human being who happens to play an instrument, who happens to have the passion uh, to pursue music. That's what's most important to me, and that's who I am as an as a person, as as a human being. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, the shell that I'm in is, like I said, quirky from Newfoundland. Um, uh, I'm very active. I became very active in, in only in my adult years. And so I am a green belt in karate and a novice salsa dancer. It's a hobby of mine. And let's see what else about me. I started as a pianist and let's see what else about me. Um, I think part of my Instagram reel revealed that I at one point experimented with a raw vegan diet and the residual effects of that is I have basically remained sugar free since 2015. <laughs> now that is impressive. Sugar free for five years, essentially, close to five years. Yeah, more than That's five amazing. years, September 29th, 2015. And there have been times that I've been... Um, uh, accidentally ingesting white sugar or intentionally ingesting white sugar. I don't think 100% is feasible unless you're extremely rigid. So I, whenever that happens, whenever a piece of chocolate ends up in my mouth, I don't beat myself up, up, up about it. And um, that's also a part of who I am. Um, 
embracing self-compassion. So as much as I am a motivated person and a violinist and a musician who's passionate, I also understand the relevance and the importance of being kind to yourself. And that's what I preach when I teach. So I like to teach that to my students and I do teach online. I have a violin boot camp that I um, uh, started in the summer and was a huge success. And I'm gearing up to launch my next one in the new year in January. That's fantastic. Very good. And you touched upon a few topics already, um, you know, health being an important factor of your life. And I think the, the topic of health and being a, being a violinist has come up on the podcast before and how, you know, you can't play well if you don't feel well. That's and, right. Yeah. And I, I truly believe in that, you know, like if you don't get enough sleep and I don't care who you are, if you can you know, if you can survive on five hours of sleep and perform a, a big concert next day, like it just doesn't work that way. So I think in the sense that in uh, the previous episode where I had Susanna Klein, who is the author of Practisma, we talk about the health and um, again, you know, being human first and really respecting your body and respecting your, your limits. You know, it's also good to know what your limits are um, when you're when you're performing the violin um, in terms of health but you also touched upon dancing so you you said salsa dancing is a hobby of yours it is and that came about six or seven or eight months after i hit the karate dojo <laughs> it was right next door although <laughs> door. i'm really yeah. although i'm really kind of concerned about the karate dojo like i do teach karate, like you know i you know in terms of like teaching my my students about you know this is a dojo you have to respect a dojo you have to respect the space and like you know, imagine that like, you know, all my little, you know, twinkle, twinkle little stars have like the, like the, the karate white belt, but actual karate, you know, how, how is that with your hands? You know, like, do yeah. your hands hurt? Do your knuckles hurt? Like you said, you're a green belt. So, you know, you're, you're, you're in the karate world in that sense. Yeah, it's been over three years and I haven't turned back. I mean, yes, I, I, it was a concern and I did actually in sparring jam my thumb. I blocked a kick and it went wrong and uh, no, it was my index finger. Yeah, it was my index finger and it did swell. It wasn't a huge hit. It just got a little bit jammed and it did swell. Then the knuckles were pretty swollen and it, it was um, very difficult to bend and my, my finger and at, in the show, the ballet show that night, it might have been Nutcracker. I think it might have been Nutcracker that we were performing that night. I still played, but it was a little uncomfortable. So, yeah, it is a risk and it's something that the the friends I have in the dojo are very aware of. My sensei is fantastic. We're all very, very careful with each other and very respectful and the respect part of the the martial arts is really quite amazing and something that i've really um imbibed from the philosophy of being a martial artist this is this, this, the, the the concept of being respectful of yourself of of others of the art form of the discipline that it requires to excel but even if you're not in it to win it and i'm not i'm certainly not going to be a competitive um, martial artist by any means i'm in it to better myself as a human being i'm in it to experience the empowerment that i feel after i train after i learn a new spin or kick or master a certain combination nation because when i do that I, it actually benefits me from the inside from the sense of uh, accomplishment empowerment and the discipline that i carry from the dojo can translate back into the violin practice room and back and forth it flows back and forth and i think it's a great compliment for the mind in particular and that's why i, I infuse it into my violin boot camps wonderful i think what's important what you're what you're getting at is that everything is kind of connected in, yeah. in our world and you know, I actually have a book right up here, actually right over here, you know, Daniel Barenboim's Everything is Connected. It's a very good book. And he talks about how like, you, you know, in life, you are, you are constantly dealing with certain things, but it all kind of relates, you know, to music and music relates to life. And, and uh, just, just a testament, like what you're saying, it's, you know, all everything is connected. And you said that you're a salsa dancer, and you started dancing. Um, how long have you been dancing salsa and um, was this before you started your career in the National Ballet or Oh was gosh, it? no. No, so, so salsa was relatively like recent. Oh yeah, karate okay. is only three, just over three years ago and then maybe six or seven, eight months after the karate dojo, I, it was the salsa studio was right next door. And oh, I, I had I, gone I, on vacation, sorry? 
I see. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So I went on vacation to uh, Dominican Republic and that's basically I returned from that vacation and realized, oh, salsa dancing is great. I had tried it 10 years prior and it dropped out of my life. In fact, I got rid of my shoes and purged them. And then 10 years later, I realized, you know what, this could be really fun. So uh, I saw my opportunity when one day I was in my karate gi and we were locked out of the studio because it was timing was off. And double booking had happened. And the salsa studio was also double booked and they were waiting for their entry into their studio. So I saw my opportunity. I walked over with my gi on. I said, hey, could I? I'm really kind of interested in salsa dancing. It's been a long time. I don't know really how. I've never taken any classes and never turned back. And I love them both. They're, they're both really great. And in fact, I think uh, not too long ago, maybe last week, I had posted on my social media a clip of me actually practicing uh, salsa dancing. And I wrote the top five things that I think are similar between learning dance and learning the violin. So both are great. And martial arts, in fact. So learning all these disciplines, they can absolutely be transferred. So based on your own experience, what are the similarities? Because I think I might have missed that Instagram post. But what what kind of similarities do you find between dancing and music, like specifically well, like uh, like salsa dancing? I mean, obviously movement can be you know it's a huge deal, and especially like when we're discussing the Bach partitas and and. So I think the, the number the first thing that comes to mind is when you're learning a new skill, you start to realize the similarity with what we have learned from the very beginning twinkle years. You put in regular practice and the regular practice helps you get there, get wherever you want to be faster rather than periodic practice or non-regular practice. If you apply the same practice discipline as you do on the violin, as you do in dancing, you will get the best results. That's one. Um, the second is I started to, to notice and learn that when you want to do fancy stuff on the violin or you want to do fancy stuff on the dance floor, you have to return back to twinkle twinkle basics sound production your basic steps your um your balance your, your point of balance everything goes right back down to the basics and practice the basics no matter how advanced you are you may be a concert soloist i mean yasha Haif is still practice shadiak <laughs> practice all of his scales so we we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, of course. Yeah. Like your uh, your Shadiak videos are hilarious because you're like literally going like at the speed of light, like Heifetz would do. And we'll get to that in a moment. I think I might accept your challenge in doing the Shadiak YouTube video, but but maybe for maybe later on in the interview we'll talk about that. Great. So I want to talk about the the audition process for when you were going to audition for the National Ballet of Canada. Because I'm sure that's not a traditional audition, or it might be, you know, maybe the same excerpts are required of a, of a ballet, you know, instance and concert master job as it is for a regular orchestra job. So can you share your thoughts uh, about your experience and what you've learned from it? And I mean, obviously you won the position, but, um, and how that, that position in the National Ballet of Canada kind of shaped your musical playing. Wow, some good questions. And it's funny that you asked me about the audition that I did for National Ballet, my position. That's a really interesting and interesting story because it happened. This is October of 2020, right? And it happened literally exactly 20 years ago. No way. Wow. Yeah. So I, I asked the right question literally 20 years later. Yeah. I fact, am that good. <laughs> your, you got psychic abilities, Eric. <laughs> I literally have in my hand here a beautiful uh, jewel gift box. I mean, for those who are just listening to podcasts and can't see video, I have a 20 year pin that they mailed to me. I'm now an old timer. I, wow, <laughs> that looks really cool. Book. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's a ballet dancer. It's in gold. And I've seen many of my colleagues put this pin on their on their concert. They're pit blacks. And I thought, wow, they've been in the orchestra a long time. Hey, guess what? I'm one of them now. <laughs> You're one of them now. But are there are there many people who are like tenure for like 20 years? Or are you like one of the, like the few? Like, is it like an elite club? Like, are you like the one of five people? Or are there like many people who are in the company for that long? Oh, there were many. There's actually in this year, there were three of us alone. And before me, there were quite a few. So there's people there for, I don't know, maybe 30, 35, who knows, even 30 years now, who knows? Um, 
yeah, I started off as quite the greenhorn and actually, um, okay. So let me review back to my audition story. It was very interesting. I Please. Was, yes. I was in my master's degree at university of Toronto and I was starting to freak out because my father was very freaked out on my behalf that I was going to be destitute and, and freelancing and busking on the streets as a violinist. <laughs> So right, I, I think every parent has that fear. It's like, oh well, my. By the way, there's nothing wrong with busking. Like I've bust all the time. Like mm -hmm. you know, in college, you know, so it's good practice if you're like afraid of stage fright. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I had great times busking. Um, so I I thought, okay, it's time to start start facing reality, and this is no longer student fantasy world. We got a rubber hit, rubber meets the road, and it's got to start look, looking at how to become a professional. So uh, I think it was my maybe third audition ever. I think the first one was a little tiny chamber orchestra. The other one was, I can't even remember, some small remote thing, I can't remember. So anyway, I, I was aiming for some, you know, regional orchestras thinking I really need to get myself into a section of violin or a violin section of some kind of regional orchestra. So I saw that the National Ballet of Canada Orchestra was holding violin jobs and two of them, in fact, one in one weekend and then uh, one was a section violin job on a Sunday and the the Sunday after that was for the assistant concert master position and word got around the city or and or the country and my colleagues were whispering into my ear oh yeah don't don't even think about that assistant con that assistant concert master job has been open for years no one has lasted no one's gotten tenure people have gotten kicked out and I said that's okay I'm not thinking about that job I really want to get the section job so the assistant concert master job was actually before and let me uh, remember this correctly the assistant concert master audition was first then the section audition was after so i thought okay from what i remember preparing for competitions local you know festivals when i was a student you always need at least a week before to get yourself ready for a mock audition mock performance dress rehearsal whatever you want to call it so i said Hmm. I put down my calendar. I think I had, I, I actually drew a hand drawn calendar and planned out the weeks. Okay. So I see, I, pl I plotted in those audition dates. I said, okay, perfect. The section violin job is on this Sunday. Week before is the assistant concertmaster. Well, that makes a great dress rehearsal. Um, the, the audition rep is exactly the same, except for a few concertmaster solos. Great. So I will learn those concert master solos. Just take the audition, get ready, win that section job, and then I'll be all set for my life. <laughs> well, it came and I played the assistant concert master job and I knew no one was going to get the job. I knew that no one was going to get hired. And I got to the finals and, oh, my chosen piece, believe it or not, was Bach Chacon. Boy, would I ever not do that again? <laughs> for your, that was your decision. Yeah. Oh That's my gosh, thing. you're, <laughs> you're brave. I'll, I'll, I'll put, I'll put it that <laughs> you're brave. <laughs> well, it's only because I, I think I was studying at the time that was the repertoire I was bringing to my lessons. It was fresh. So, I mean, what else was I going to play something that wasn't so good under my fingers? So anyway, I know that I did not play perfectly. There was one concert master solo. I, I kind of biffed on some high one arpeggio note. And despite that, uh, I got into the finals. I think for two of us left or three of us left. And we waited after the, we played the finals and we waited and waited. And I said, why are we waiting so long? Like, we all know that no one's going to get this job. So I said, oh, I really need to go to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom. I, I, I opened the door and boom, there was a personnel manager right in front of me, Jean. And Jean said, oh, we were looking for you. I said, what, what? I was just, my hands were still wet. You know, kind of from opening the door and washing my hands. She said, you won the job. <laughs> Come into the room and meet the rest of the committee. And I said, wow, what? <laughs> that's incredible. You're like, wait, is this happening? Yeah, I was a student. I was in my first year of my master's degree and I went home back to my dorm, my dorm room. And I said, oh boy, I better get, I have to practice for my lesson tomorrow. I got to reset. I'm at home and practice some more. <laughs> I had some deadlines at school. So that's my story of how I did the audition. <laughs> that's crazy. I, I didn't know this about you, but wow. And this was during your first year in master. You kind of just wanted audition experience. You kind of were under the impression like, you know what? Not going to happen. I'm just doing this for the experience. What the, what's the worst that can happen? Well, right? I mean, I was trying to get somewhere. I mean, I knew it had, I had to get 
eventually a job. So Surely, I, yeah. I, try, I, I gave it a shot and there you go. So, um, yeah, it's not an easy route. Auditions are kind of tough, but actually I, I admire you so much because you're, you're clearly a forward thinking entrepreneur. And I really think that many more of us really need to follow in your footsteps and develop the entrepreneurial mind. Yeah. And actually, you know, I, I, I preach about this because it's not a new idea. It's, it's not so much that it has, you know, entrepreneurship in music has existed for many, many years. Actually, that's the reason why I have, you know, Papa Haydn, you know, oh, sorry, uh, knocked my <laughs> stereo up. But I, that's the reason why I have Papa Haydn, you know, Haydn quartets on the shelf. Because Haydn to me was like the OG entrepreneur, mm. right? Because yes, he had this wonderful job in... Um, the print as you know, as the Esther musician yeah, and Prince of Esterhazy, right? But then after Prince of Esterhazy died, you know, he just he created so much value to his name, to his brand as Joseph Haydn. Then he can just go anywhere in Europe, and people are going to buy tickets because he's built so much um, brand value throughout these years through his music, through quartets, symphonies, whatever it is. And he, you know, he had material, he had that fame going out of that position and he had free reign of like to do whatever he wanted to do. So, and then he went to London and he, you know, met concert promoters that could easily promote his name because he knows that there will be an income, uh, income revenue coming because of that name. So, you know, it's, it's not a new idea. You know, the medium has changed, but the messages are the same in, in my view, at least, um, so, you know, and my personal, and I'm sure you can relate to this too, because I think you and I are on the similar like wavelength in terms of talking about entrepreneurship and, you know, you're doing your, your YouTube videos, your Instagram reels, you're doing the violent, uh, boot camp, and you also have violin chats. All, all of this is kind of to create awareness, you know, it's just another way of marketing yourself and you don't have to pay a fortune to be able to do that, which is brilliant. You know, and I think a lot of musicians, even myself included, we all go through this time of, am I good enough, right? But I mean, of course, like realistically, we need to have a job after college because that's adult thinking, adult life. But if you do the same thing, if you love the process throughout a long period of time, then you'll find success. You know, like this is, you know, I remember when I left my, you know, home to go to undergrad, that was like nine years ago. And never would I have, never would have I expected to start a podcast about violin. You know, I was kind of on the orchestral route just to be like, I, because again, you know, my, I guess it comes from like my family's thinking because my family were uh, first generation uh, immigrants. You know, I'm a second generation, first generation American born, but second generation um, uh Polish, Polish American. So they're always under the mindset of like, okay, you need something that's stable. You need something that's a job, right? And, you know, musicians in Poland back when at their age, like, like in the teens, like their teenagers and twenties, it, it didn't really pay that well in Poland. So they're like, you need to have a good stable job. And that's why, right, that's why I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, I'm looking at the salaries of all these orchestras. And, you know, they're like pretty decent, like middle class, what they consider middle class salaries, like 45K and up. And I'm like, okay, well, it makes sense for me to pursue all of my time to have that job stability in the future. But then that last year of my, uh, of college, that totally went down the drain because I'm like, okay, I got to start from scratch and I'm, I got to rethink this. I got to rethink all of this. So that's, I mean, I don't mean to uh, <laughs> carry on because of, you know, the interview is about you and not about me, but it's, um, yeah, but that's, that's how, that's how I can relate to you because it's a lot of, um, a lot of that kind of thinking and the entrepreneurial thinking is nothing new. It's just the medium has changed. And um, yeah. So what are your, what are your thoughts on the whole like entrepreneurial direction that I think musicians are finally starting to get on that train. What do you, what do you think of that? Well, I think it's great that the unfortunate pandemic is making, paving the way for people who are, are 
let's say, brave enough and open enough to, to walk that highway. The highway is now blasted open for us. And it's up to the person to decide whether that is going to be something they want to pursue or not. And there may be barriers. I don't know for, for everybody, but I'm going to make it a safe assumption that much of that obstacle is internal from self-doubt and fear. So fear may come from, I don't know if I have the skills uh, maybe I don't know if I even qualify as someone someone that someone could pay money to, for my skills. That definitely came into my head too, imposter syndrome. So in terms of being an entrepreneur, mindset is the first thing we all need to address. Uh, and that that starts off with taking stock of what we're good at, what makes us unique. And I know I've heard you preach that. And what makes us unique, what we have to offer. And we all have something to offer because we're in all incredibly unique. We are all made incredibly unique. We all come from different locations, have different experiences and have different training. And just by virtue of, of those three variables, that makes us very um, packageable. And for someone who wants to, let's say, throw money your way and pay for your knowledge and your expertise, it is absolutely possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in addition to that, like all passing on this knowledge and expertise can be outside of your actual violin playing. I think, you know, um, times are tough, of course. And I think the more people realize that orchestras are shut down, like I think recently New York Phil and LA Phil have canceled their entire season, yeah. right? Un until like fall 2021. Let that sink in for a moment, you know? I can't even imagine what that must be like for all those musicians who are now out of a job. Exactly. Yeah. So I think diversifying, diversification is definitely going to be an important thing where conservatories and music schools are going to hopefully transition to. Like, you know, it's not enough to just play the violin. No. I think people really need to understand that, that, you know, winning a competition, although it helps, if you're a fantastic player, then great. You know, if you want a job, great. You get that, you know, you get that boost, but anybody can do it. And I think because of the internet has given, there's no middleman anymore. No, there's no middle person. So um, I, I'm glad that I'm glad that you say that. And also, you know, you said the word entrepreneur, but you know, a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs. <laughs> entrepreneurs. Oh, I haven't heard that before. Entrepreneurs. So, <laughs> But the word entrepreneur is, you know, a person who creates a business for themselves. And it's possible to create a business for yourself as a musician. It is possible. The question is, are you willing to, and are you like, are you going to enjoy the process of like getting to the point where you want to be? And I think you're like Eric or Lynn, like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm sacrificing five hours a day practicing my instrument and studying this history. Like, yes, that's important, right? But that what will get you to the next level. You know, if you really enjoy what you do, what is your goal? And, you know, in episode 12 of the Violin Podcast, I talk about, you know, being a music business and what are you going to offer the world? What are you going to, what kind of value do you bring? And, and I see that what you're doing with violin chats, and I actually want to transition into violin chats because um, I know you're taking a, taking a break from violin chats, but you had some great, some great guests. Can you talk about your guests and what you've learned from violin chats? Sure. Yeah, I started that interview series on YouTube and Facebook, violin chats, basically violin. That happened to become my nickname from high school. So I thought, <laughs> oh, cool, I'll just name it violin chats, and there we go. And originally I had started to... Um, broadcast those those guests that I invited because uh, let's see three three of them yes three of them were guest artists in my summer violin boot camp so I really wanted to showcase them and their expertise to to say these are the fantastic people guest experts that I have coming to teach inside of my program so I had Nathan Cole and I had the author of what every violinist needs to know about the body Jennifer Johnson who is a friend and colleague in Newfoundland where I'm from and I had uh, the violinist from the Cecilia string quartet first violinist of the Cecilia string quartet Dr. Min Jung Ko from the University of Oklahoma and I also had those the um, performance psychologist Dr. Don Green on my 
uh, series. And I also had a uh, violinist from Afiara String Quartet, Tim Cantor. And they were all really fantastic. Uh, Dr. Min and Tim, they gave fantastic violin practice tips, really great on chamber music, on how to learn notes faster, how to use the, the metronome and start building a musicality within inside of the, the beat. Um, Dr. Green talked about um, the, like being a hero on transforming into the persona of a hero when you're trying to deal with your own performance anxiety. And Nathan, well, that one was that was episode one. It's called uh, Coffee, Coffee with Nathan, <laughs> Coffee with Nathan Cole. And we talked about everything Great. from a blind date story to his Stradivarius to his his um, secret uh, hidden talents. It was a really fun um, episode. That's awesome. And of course, like Nathan Cole, like he started the YouTube train many, many years ago, right? He just started making videos on YouTube. And 2008, it, I think it was 2008 and look at him now, like 12, 12 years later, he's built an incredible following, you know, mm -hmm. people know who Nathan Cole is. He, of course, he, people knew him cause he was, you know, he's in the LA Phil, but in addition to that, it's more so like, again, offering, I know that he had like the Violympics. I think yes. that's genius, yeah. genius idea to kind of bring the violin community together and practice because we all kind of like felt that funk. I don't know about you. Have you felt like the, the violin practicing funk? Cause there was like a moment where I'm like, I'm going to be practicing three Paganini Caprice by the end of the month. And I am going to just dominate that, that Paganini book. And then like, you know, like fast forward, I'm like, I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even like, like I didn't do anything, yeah. but, um, but I think, days. yeah, so that's incredible. What you, and remind me the performance psychologist that you interviewed. Oh, Dr. Don Green. Dr. Don Green. Yeah, um, he's the author of multiple, multiple books, audition success, performance success. I think he's launching his book right now. If not, if not already launched now, his latest book is out now as well. Yeah. Great, I'll have to take a look at that because I'll be really interested to have him on the on the violin podcast in oh, terms of performance sure. psychology. Because in the last episode with Susanna Klein, we talked about how there aren't enough like there there are like sports psychologists. Yes. Right? And there are but there there are music therapists, but are there any like music psychologists to enhance performance? Right. Uh, yeah, definitely. And he he specifically likes working with classical musicians and those are his favorite clients. He's taught at Juilliard. Um, he's taught at New World Symphony. He's worked with members of the um, Hawaii uh, Honolulu Symphony. Um, he, but um, before that, he was working with Olympic athletes and Formula One race car drivers and golfers. Um, in fact, his training is in diving. He was working with the Olympic diving team. So he has, that's incredible. Now, yeah. Now he has plenty of experience with top, top, top uh, symphony musicians winning lots and lots of jobs. Um, horn, principal horn here and um, principal viola there, like all, all over the US and all over the world. Yeah. Let's talk about how, because I, you said that Don Green was in your violin boot camp, right? Um, he was a guest in my violin chat. Oh, he was, your, he was a guest in your violin chat. Yes. But I and do... I actually coached with him. I actually did spend a lot of time. I see. Him. Okay. Sorry. I got, I got it backwards, but let's talk about your violin boot camp and you know, from like a logistical standpoint, did you do, did you form violin boot camp by yourself? Did it stem from like an idea that you heard from somewhere else? Where, where did that, how did the violin boot camp come about? So I was teaching at Memorial University of Newfoundland as an assistant professor. I was just there as a sabbatical replacement from January 2020 up to April 2020. And as we know, pandemic hit in March 2020. So right. that semester got truncated. So I got abandoned, or not abandoned, I got stranded in Newfoundland where I was teaching. And luckily I'm from there. So I was hanging out with my family. And when pandemic hit, I started to, I don't know how, I, the ball started to roll very quickly. I enrolled in some music and business entrepreneurial workshops, courses, this and that. And all of a sudden I had this realization, I could start teaching. And then I, teaching became, oh, teaching models can now become this. And I was looking at the, the intensive workshop led by Jennifer Rosenfeld, who is actually right now in a five free, free five day challenge. Um, and we'll, by the time this podcast is out, we'll be leaving a, a November um, uh, intensive. And she happens to be Nathan Cole's business coach, among other um, musicians 
it, or that she has clients uh, as clients. So after taking those courses, I started to realize I can create a program. And that just quickly evolved into the concept of an eight week boot camp that I offered. And I had 17 violinists from Canada and the US enrolled, and it was fantastic. We had a lot of fun. I made it fun. I made it challenging. I incorporated technique classes every week. I had an hour and a half masterclass every Monday. I had actually group practice sessions, which I um, created called Linja sessions. And Linja happens to be another one of my nicknames. Um, I like it. <laughs> that was before I started karate. <laughs> Violinja. So I like it. <laughs> yeah, Violinja. So we had the Violinja troupe. And we would meet, uh, we met four times a week, actually, and on, on Zoom for an hour. And every 15 minutes, I was trying to implement the Pomodoro technique, where you turn on a timer, and you focus specifically on your task for 15 minutes. And then when the timer went off, I would ask everyone to come back on and meet back on Zoom. And I would then incorporate what I learned from Dr. Don Green and in, in and try to infuse some basically a mock audition kind of atmosphere. So I basically randomly called on people. Okay, could you please demonstrate what you were practicing? And one of them, if if Kathleen is out there, Kathleen Koval, she said, "Am I allowed to call on you?" So she she turned the game back on me. I said, "Okay, fine, all right." I I was practicing too. So they got to practice along with me. So uh, she asked, okay, can, can I call on you? So she randomly picked. So basically we played musical tag. I would tag somebody, okay, it's your turn to play. And then I would say, okay, your turn to pick someone else to play randomly. So pass the ball around, kind of like a musical sport game. So and, they would choose another person. And, and I don't mean to interrupt you. Well, what, was, uh, what was the age range? Uh, oh, uh, the youngest was 16. And I had the oldest um, as I think he was, I think he was a older retired lawyer. Yeah, so he was older. So it ranged, but basically I think the average was um, uh, late 20s, 30s. I had two older um, amateurs in their 40s, 50s. Yeah, so it really ranged. I see. So um, do you do any, te I mean, you, you had the sabbatical, uh, you know, you're doing this position for the spring term. Do you teach in any other locations except playing for the, for the ballet? No, I teach, teach solely online and I'm going to be launching the boot camp, which is where I'm going to be teaching. So I do invite people to to message me privately if they want to study with me individually. Absolutely. And I've had many people all around the world from Asia to Europe and South America in, um, contact me. Um, so that's always on the table if people want to study with me privately. But right now I'm put, putting a lot of energy into um, preparing for the launch. And so by November you will definitely see me launch a free three-day training. It's going to be ninja themed, just like my last one, which was in June. In June, it was called How to Practice Like a Ninja. And yeah, I do remember that one. You do yeah. remember that? Yeah, yes. it was really fun. And I will be launching part two of that. So it's going to be, okay, all right. You're going to be the first to hear this. Your listeners will be the first to hear this. I have not actually um, leaked this out. It's going to Great. Be so out. this is a violin podcast exclusive, exclusive. everyone. This is an exclusive yeah. Yeah. announcement. I have not even formulated all the details myself, but I will leak it to you, Eric, and your followers. This is the second workshop. It's going to be three days. It's going to be called How to Be a Musical Ninja. I've had several people, lots of students ask me, how do we play more musically? How do we interpret this so it's more interesting? Uh, how do we, I had one person on Instagram ask of that. How do we address musicality? So I thought, hmm, there's enough people asking, what do we do after we figure out all the practice techniques? What do we do when we know how to do Pomodoro technique? And so I realized, okay, you know what? I do have a few tricks that I think have accumulated over the past, you know, 20 odd years or how many, 30, for 30 years or whatever. And I've, categorize them i've come up with 13 different things that you can act actually do use implement some of them are very immediate some of them will take a little bit more time and i've categorized them all and basically i was going to make a, a youtube video out of it 13 ways to deepen your musical interpretation but no i'm going to make it into a three-day workshop how to be a musical ninja so you have to stay tuned for that awesome i like how you're being very creative during this time and i know that despite the tragedy of you know COVID-19 and you know who knows when this is going to end but there, I guess there is a silver lining I think when we move back or you know I'm I'm just thinking in my head that like 30 40 years down the road we're going to be talking about what has been done during this time in 2020 and I think it's going to be a it's going to be a game changer for anyone who is um really uh 
tech savvy, who's also uh, really creative with how they use their time in addition to um, just trying to make things work. And of course, not everybody. It, yeah, it's, it's just it's just tough. And I I, I really appreciate you know you just you're providing a, a very valuable service for people who need lessons, right? And you know you're given. I think that's again part of being an entrepreneur, where you know you're providing an opportunity to solve a problem. That's that's what it's all about. Um, and on um, on the COVID nineteen topic, I'm sure I am sure that the National Ballet of Canada has suspended concerts for the foreseeable future. Um, tell us about like get, um, like that email or that message that you got from the organization, like. And has there any has there been any progress as to trying to reopen for audiences in Canada? Well, right now I'm actually waiting for our town hall meeting on November fourth. Depending on when this podcast is released, I'm just waiting for that official announcement and to to hear what exactly is going to be announced for our performances in March and June. Um, I'm my, my mouth is going to be just closed for now until the official word that we get. Of course, but yeah. Of course, I mean, we're all, I basically, I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. I'm forging ahead with the, the momentum that I've built already since March, and I'm going to just keep going and basically look out for myself, which I highly recommend everyone else do as well. And I'm sure everyone else is doing that. If not, if you're t- taking a gap year, great. If you're taking a sabbatical year, fantastic. You deserve that. Go ahead and enjoy that. I know other musicians are doing that. Go ahead, take that gap year and just enjoy. If you've got the savings, if you've got the money, great. If you don't have the money, then then I wish you all the best and all the luck and strength and courage that you will need to figure your way through, as we all do. Uh, I know that I was very scared <laughs> becoming a first-time entrepreneur myself, but I've done it. And you've done it. Papa Haydn has done it. We have a long history of people doing it and we can do it. So it is possible despite orchestras shutting their doors, shutting audiences down, people are out there. We just have to change the medium, just as you beautifully said. The medium now is online. It's in front of a camera, it's with a microphone. That's the reality of it. It's People are still there. We just have to figure out how to use the new environment. Yeah, and also um, the, another thing that I like about the you know Mozart and Haydn is that for them to reach new audiences they had to create new content and for them new content was new music so you know ever since Mendelssohn has premiered that Bach piece and you know we've just been really obsessed with playing music of the past but is there going to be a shift in playing new music will there be like a new movement and new music and I know um, with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that's been happening all across the globe, I I'm pretty sure that might be the case in the future, um, and it's uh yeah it's, it's it's an ongoing conversation and I think any nobody has a clear answer as to just what you beautifully said is like you know all in all first and foremost you have to take care of yourself you know just like we said in the beginning of the podcast you can't play if you don't feel well if you don't feel it then you have to take steps in order for you to feel well so that way you play at your at your best and in addition to that just share your message to the world mm-hmm. that's you know you, you have a clear message i have a clear message and this violin podcast is actually as a result of the pandemic i started this podcast during the pandemic because there was going to be a need where people need a resource to kind of go to that's available to anyone right so that's the reason and if the moment you find your mission as a musician then all everything else kind of takes care of itself so um so lynn to wrap up this podcast what specific day will you be launching this this three-day workshop how can people learn more about you and your programs uh i will determine the dates very soon and for that launch uh the specific details of the launch i think it's best if you get on my email list and let's see the best way to do that i would say is to go to my website linquo.com and on on the front page you're going to see uh an opportunity to watch my top five spiccato mistakes tutorial so if you click on that to access, then you will be asked to enter your email in 
and then you'll get to access two full tutorials on, on me explaining the top five mistakes and how to fix them. And I add in some bonus spiccato tips. So if you click on that, you'll get on my email list and that's how you'll hear about the launch details for the workshop as well as the boot camp in, in the year 2021. Um, if all else fell, fails, you can find me on social media on Instagram at V I O L Y N N K U O violin quo. And that's the same on Facebook and on YouTube. I'm Lynn Quo. So all three media platforms, you're going to find me. You're going to find all my craziness, my quirkiness and my Shradiac um, tutorials <laughs> <laughs> and my Instagram reels. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, I'll leave all the links to uh, Lynn's information, her website, her Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. And if you have any questions, comments or concerns, just leave comments in uh, the comments section on the podcast platform of your choice, either whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, whatever it is. And, you know, let's get this conversation going. Let's get this dialogue going. And um, if you have any ideas, um, I'll leave my email, the Violin Podcast email. If you have any ideas, topics, people that we should interview on the Violin Podcast, that'll be amazing. And again, thank you for listening to the Violin Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to hit the subscribe button. Please make sure you're following our podcast, but also take a look at our Patreon page. If you've been listening for, um, on the Violin Podcast, you know that you know, I try to create as many resources as possible. One uh, one way to support the podcast is doing $2 a month. That's less than a cup of coffee. And uh, that'll really, really help the podcast a lot. Just hit the link on the Patreon page. That'll really help. And again, thank you so much, Lynn. Really, really appreciate it. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me.